Did you guys ever see the movie Signs? I, I loved that movie. When I was in college, I worked on this small family farm here in town. Uh, and I just, I loved it. And we, we would drive swathers at night, cutting grass. And, and one of the nights, all of us got together, everybody on the, the swather team got together and we went and saw this movie signs, the M night Shyamalan one with Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix. And they're in the, you know, little farmhouse with the cornfields and the aliens and stuff. I remember seeing that movie in the theater and it scared the living daylights out of me. And I, Loved it. It was the first M. Night Shyamalan movie that I had seen um, that that wasn't spoiled. I, I kind of, when, uh, what was that, the first one, The Sixth Sense. When that came out, my parents rented it, and I remember walking downstairs at the very final scene where the little kid figures everything out, right? I see dead people, and I was like, oh, well, that kind of ruined that movie for me. So I went and saw Signs, and, and there's that scene at the very end. And, and if you haven't seen it yet, I won't spoil it for you like I spoiled Sixth Sense for myself. But there's that scene where Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix are standing in the living room. And Mel Gibson turns to Joaquin Phoenix and he says, swing away, Meryl. And, and it's in that moment where you can kind of see Mel Gibson's character figure everything out, right? All these puzzle pieces just kind of click together and it all comes into focus and it's like oh my gosh holy smokes everything that's happened up to this point is leading to this moment and i loved that feeling it was just brilliant and if you've ever had one of those experiences in life you know what that feels like when everything comes into focus and you you finally understand your purpose and if you've had an experience like that spiritually it is absolutely transformational for your life. I, I had one of those experiences in, in 2015. I was out mowing my lawn and, uh, and listening to this sermon series. And uh, I didn't spoil it, Ryan. And yes, this is live stats. Quit texting me. I, I had this moment where I was out mowing my lawn. And I was listening to this sermon series by Andy Stanley called Brand New. And for me, everything spiritually just clicked. It, it, was, it was just amazing. I had grown up a Christian. I had gone to a Christian college to be a Christian pastor. I had pastored for almost 10 years at that point. And yet listening to this sermon series, for whatever reason, it took all of my past experience, the traditions that I'd grown up with, the scripture that I loved, all of these things, and, and it just kind of boiled them down to their most important, most critical essence. And it was like a light bulb went off. It, it was like that moment, if you remember in the mall where you'd walk up to those paintings, or the, the, I guess they weren't even paintings, they're like computerized print-offs, and they were all fuzzy and you'd, you'd like mess with your eyes, you'd cross your eyes just enough and all of a sudden, boom! you could see in full beautiful 3D glory that dolphin jumping out of the water. And it was like, wow, everything changed. And for me, one of those moments in my life was this series by Andy Stanley. And for the next couple of weeks, I wanna walk you through some of the principles that I found so helpful in that series. And the, the big idea was this, this thing that he calls the temple model. The temple model, it, it kind of, it, it encapsulates all religions from the very beginning of time. They all have these four main things. They have sacred places, they have sacred text, sacred men, and sincere followers. Th these sacred places are where you have to go to meet God. Where if you're in that location, <clears throat> There's this special thing that either happened there or, or that makes it incredibly important and critical to those followers that they be in that location to meet with their God. And they have these, these special sacred texts that were given to them usually centuries before. And these sacred men are the only ones that are allowed to interpret those texts and then pass on that information of how to be close with God, how to live the right life, and, and ultimately how to get to heaven or the afterlife or, or whatever that religion teaches. But you must listen to those sacred men. You must 
allow them to tell you those secret texts in those special places. And, and that's the, the, the temple model. And, and every religion has followed this for eternity until Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up to the, the Jewish people, and they're living the reality of this temple model, right? They have to go to Jerusalem. They have to make these sacrifices. They have these sacred scrolls from these ancient prophets who've predicted these things in the future, and all of these rules that these sacred men have, have put in place for them so that they can follow and, and be right with God, have this relationship with their creator. And if they don't follow these things, very bad things will happen. And then Jesus arrives. Everything changes. And you, you might be sitting there in your, <laughs> in your living room thinking, well, Pastor Trevor, that's, that sounds kind of like what we do every week at, at Oasis. And we're not technically meeting in a sacred place right now, but, but we did for, for like 11 years. We met every week in a special place. And aren't you that guy who, who would hold up that sacred text and you would preach to us out of it? And, and when you preach, I don't, I don't read that stuff. I mean, you pull out all this Greek and this Hebrew and, and the, the ancient historical context that you must understand to really get what God is trying to say. Like, isn't that what Oasis does every week? And, and, and in some instances, yeah, that, that's kind of what we do. That's a lot of what the American church and frankly, any church at the moment does. But that's not the essence. Not, that's not the most critical foundational thing that the church was built on. The church was actually built on something far more simple. And that's where we're going to dive in over the next couple of weeks, because as the world around us changes dramatically, sometimes daily, I think it's critically important for us to go back to the very beginning, the original mission statement, to look at that deeply and to own it, no matter what's happening outside. And so let's dive into these big four things, sacred places, sacred texts, sacred men, and sincere followers. For, for Jesus, there were no more sacred places. The temple was incredibly important. It had been for centuries. But when Jesus showed up, it was not the temple that was sacred to him. Jesus taught that every single person that he came into contact with, every single person that you will ever be with, to stand shoulder to shoulder with or sit next to on a couch or have a conversation with at the office, those people are far more sacred than any piece of dirt or ground that you'll ever stand on. Any building you'll ever walk into pales in comparison to the godliness of the people that you're surrounded with. And believe me, I've been to those places. I've been to Israel. I've, I've toured the Holy Land. I've stood in some unbelievable spots that were just, I mean, magical really is the only word that I could use to describe it. The, the history, the, but they're not what Jesus came to die for. Jesus didn't come to live and to die and to be raised from the dead for property. He did it for people. And while there are important places that will always hold a place in our hearts, they're not the foundation of what we do. You don't have to go anywhere specific in order to connect with God. And praise Jesus for that because you guys are in your homes, I'm in my home, and we believe that the Holy Spirit can meet with us even at the bottom of a well. You can be in the, the most beautiful cathedral in all of Europe. You can be in the middle of a war zone, and God will meet you there in the exact same way. There is no such thing as the church in reference to a building. It just isn't there. And I know this is going to be another one of those times where I toss some Greek out at you, but when you read through scripture, when you hear the words, the word church, it's actually not church. The word is ecclesia. It means a gathering of people, a community, a congregation of people. 
It doesn't mean building. It doesn't mean land. It doesn't mean sanctuary. It means people. You are the church. We are the church. When we gather, when we are out in public, when we're in private with our families, we are the church. And for Jesus, there were no sacred places. There were sacred people because that's who he came to die for. And, and when it comes to the, the text, it's fascinating watching Jesus in the gospels reinterpret these texts that, that the people have interpreted for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, in the Sermon on the Mount alone, Jesus walks through so many scriptures that the people were well aware of. They had them memorized. They had been taught them over and over and over for their whole lives. And, and then Jesus comes along and he says, hey, you've heard it said, but I say to you, you've heard it said an eye for an eye, but I tell you, if somebody strikes you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If somebody requires you to go a mile, go with them another. You've heard it said one thing, but I'm telling you another. Jesus begins to change this text. It wasn't necessarily the text, but it was the way in which people were reading it. They had interpreted it. And so he takes it and he fulfills the text. He fulfills the prophets. He fulfills the law. All of the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. It's a mind-blowing thing. In the Sermon on the Mount, there's this moment where, where he, he says, I haven't come to abolish the law. I'm not tossing all of it in the garbage, but I am here to fulfill it. All of those things that you've read, all of those prophecies, everything that God has been doing in all of human history has led up to me. I am what scripture has been pointing to this whole time. It was incredible. It was absolutely nuts. And, and for the people that were hearing that for the very first time, this was revolutionary. It was almost offensive to have someone with that level of gall to be able to say everything you've ever known, everything God has ever taught you, it's been all about me. It was incredibly impressive. And, and the people who were the most offended by that, the, the priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the, the sacred men who had held on to this sacred text, who, who held on to the rights to be in those sacred places, they were absolutely livid because they had held the key. They had been the one with the power. They were the ones who were telling the people what was what, what was right, what was wrong, how to be in relationship with God. They were the ones that Jesus was coming to say, listen, you don't need them anymore. They're no longer valid. Their authority is gone. It is now me and mine. You don't need a high priest to stand before God, to mediate between you and God any longer. You can do that personally, on your own. When, when Jesus dies, there's this moment that the Gospels record in the Holy of Holies where the veil is torn. Th this massive, incredible cloth veil that was built to separate the presence of God from the presence of humanity. In the moment that Jesus dies, that thing tears from the ceiling all the way to the floor, splitting open this barrier. No longer would God be separated from the people. No longer would the people have to go to someone who was sacred, someone who was special, and beg for their intervention. God had come to the people, and there was no longer anything standing between them. And as followers, as, as sacred people ourselves, sincere followers who deeply want to connect with God, it's our job to look at these things and to realize we don't need sacred places any longer. 
We don't need someone to tell us what the text says. We don't need someone to be able to go to God and forgive us of our sins. I I don't know if you guys saw recently, but um, Pope Francis, for the very first time since 1215 AD, made a decree allowing Catholics to seek forgiveness from God on their own, to be able to go to God and ask for forgiveness. You don't have to go right now for the moment to confession. You don't have to go to a priest as a mediator. You can actually approach God on your own, just the way that Jesus meant for it originally to be. It it was mind blowing. And for Jesus in his very final moments, in this upper room when when he's celebrating Passover with his men for the very last time. This ancient sacred tradition that my family and I celebrated at our table just this last week. This meal that is full of so much symbolism. <clears throat> Everything that you eat represents something else. There's scriptures that you read. There's stories that you tell of the way that God brought Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, saved all of the people, this meal that represents this incredible moment, this most sacred time for the, the Hebrew people. Jesus is having this meal with his, his men, and they get to the, the point in the meal where they break the bread. And Jesus tells them, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is the new covenant that is formed in my blood. No longer will you need sacrifices. No longer are you going to be celebrating all of the things of the past. I'm doing something brand new. And all of those things are critically important. All of them have brought us to this point, but we're moving forward. And everything that God has ever done can be summed up in a single word. Love. That is the new command that Jesus gives, love one another. And if you're doing that, if you're loving God, if you're loving people, and if you're serving out of that love, you fulfilled your purpose. That is why the the mission statement of our church is to love God, to love people and to serve the world. And no matter what's happening outside, no matter what's going on around the globe, no matter what's happening in our community, we will always be here because our mission will never change. It hasn't changed in the last 2000 years from when Jesus gave it to his disciples for the very first time. And it's what gets us up every morning. It's what we gauge ourselves with at the end of the night as we lay our heads on our pillows. That's why Oasis will continue, because our mission is to love God, to love people, and to serve the world.